Can you see the... Um, there's so many people have turned off the lights. Literally cold. Could have been tons worse with the snow, couldn't it? So uh, I really appreciate that you've all turned out. Don't expect too much of me. I'm not really professional at this. I'm just bluffing it all. Um, so a little bit about me first for those who haven't um, uh, been to one of my talks before. Um, I'm Chris Wilmer from Whaley Bridge. Um, I'm a bit of a passionate local historian. The older I've got, the more interested I've become in local history, and especially with joining Furnace Fair Historical Society, which is all linked in with Whaley's history. And between us, me and David have been, we've been finding out some very interesting things about our local history, which is really, is, is, I, I just love it in any case. So I just want to pass on my, my love and things to you as well. Um, my interest in Romans began several years ago, um, quite a lot of years, but I've always known about them in the Buxton area because we know, everybody knows about the Roman baths, don't they, at, uh, on, under the Crescent Hotel and the Saint and, um, Old Hall Hotel. Well, about five years ago, we formed a, a, a group, a society called the Buxton Roman uh, Society. And one of my fellow society members is here tonight. There's not a great deal to know about the Romans that's written. Uh, the scant knowledge, because it wasn't really a place of, 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 of anything special. There was no buildings, there was no fortress, there was nothing. So what little evidence there is has either been covered up, uh, I, mean, li I mean literally covered up, but it's, it's not really been written about in favour of other things. And of course the funding, funding for things is, is what makes something uh, poignant and relevant. There's no funding for anything to do with the Roman presence in Buxton, despite it being there from the beginning of the, in the first century right till the fall of the Roman Empire. So my talk is going to be about the normal people, the people in the environment at the time and their lifestyle. It's not about Roman battles. We know about Roman soldiers. We've done all of that. So I'm just going to uh, introduce the subjects I'm going to be talking about. I look very professional, don't I? Really? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I've impressed myself this time. Really. I've got a PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm going to take you on a journey um, of us, basically. Us Celts, as we were back in the days in the Iron Age, before life changed from one day to the next, and it became the Roman period. That's when life changed. The locals, they arrived... The, uh, sorry, the locals... Uh, in AD 43, um, that's about us, the, the Celts, and who we were. The next section's about when the invaders arrived, because let's face it, that's what they were. The minerals, a cave, sounds mysterious, doesn't it? The waters, which we know about the waters. Things in common that we have between us and them now and then. There's a lot. And then I'll just uh, sum things up at the end. What I've made for you as samples, and this is part of the talk over here, is some Roman samples of food. Uh, help yourself. There's two different types. And I've produced a little double-sided uh, recipe sheet as well. And I have made all of these, I have to tell you. I've made them all, put them to the test. And uh, they're open to a bit of interpretation. And uh, <laughs> some of them were really written in the days of uh, Epicurus in the Roman times. So, yeah. So here we go. So, the local, the local, I don't know why I'm looking there, I've got this here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all the way there then. <laughs> we locals in that period, in AD 43, we were one of either three tribes. My feeling is that this area was the meeting point, like Three Shires Head. It was like the meeting point for three tribes. Um, the first one was the, uh, the Brigantes, which was the biggest tribe in the whole of the uh, British Isles at the time. It reached as far as Cumbria, well, the, what became the Roman, uh, the Hadrian's Wall, and it reached as far south as about uh, um, Stoke-on-Trent, and, and so it was a big, they were huge, they were huge, the Brigantes, and they were fierce. Well, of course they were fierce, because they had to defend their huge territory. The Curitani, Curiotalvi, they were in the east, uh, so in the River Humber area, uh, River Humber, of course, the, the, the inlet port there where the Romans would have come in at, on that side as well. Still to this day, they were, they were farmers because all the land's low level and fertile there. So that's, that's what they were in those days. 
the Cornovi in the south, uh, they were from Staffordshire, uh, but their territory reached up as far as Chester. So it's all kind of centralising, as you'll see, in one area. The arrival of the Romans signified the end of the Iron Age. That was it. The Iron Age had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. The arrival of the Romans changed everything, and that is the beginning of history. Prehistory means with, without written word. When the Romans arrived, they had all the written word. That's when history really started. Here we see a map of the British Iron, uh, British Iron Age tribes. That lady there, I'll talk to you about her in a bit. Um, so you can see the Iron Age tribes were all over the British Isles. In no particular order, they were just random uh, tribes. There were only two queens in the English tribes. Everybody knows, of course, about Queen Boadicea or Boudicca of the Iceni tribes. She was in East Anglia, wasn't she, where the Romans first, when they first invaded, uh, she stood up to the Romans and there was bitter, bitter battles. But there was another one, and she was Cartimandua, the queen of the Briganti tribe. Fierce woman. However, she was just uh, not infallible. She um, cheated on her husband with a Roman consort, and nothing changes in the world, does it? <laughs> However, and she betrayed her people. I'll talk more about her shortly. Uh, she lost out. Of course she did. She lost out when the Romans failed to defend her. Really, nothing changes in life. And there you'll see uh, Cartier Mandua leading her people and stepping up to the Romans like Bodicea did. The times and those were the, were the tribes. Or everybody belonged to, the, to a tribe. And the tribal system was feudal, which means we're always fighting and falling out. Again, nothing changes, does it, really? Territories were defended. And as you'll know, many of you, the, the hill forts, the highest part round here, are Fincop in Bakewell, there, <coughs> Castle Nays, which is above Coombs in Chapel and Nifrit, and Mantor, of course. All these places, if anybody's been up to these hilltop forts, you will see the reason why they put them there is because they were at the highest point. They could overlook the land and spot the enemy coming and defend their territory. Of course, when the Romans got to these forts as well, they just took them over and made them part of their, a part of their system. There you'll see a couple of the, uh, the Iron Age Celts there, living life to the full in their huts and their... Yeah, well, the clothing's very basic, isn't it? But uh, this is how it was. It was very primitive. And there, this is how the top of Mantor would have looked. You know, with the huts and everything and smoke and... Uh, life never changed for many, many years. It really didn't. Even when the Romans were here, they, they it stayed like this for many, many years. Until one day. It all changed in one day. <coughs> and there you can see one of the Celts there sheltering his child from the encroaching Roman soldiers, who just marched in and took over everything. The invaders arrived in AD 79, which, many of you might know, was the same year of the Pompeii and Herculaneum disaster in Naples, in Italy. You only have to think about those times and the images that we see to see how life was for the Romans. The Roman Empire was a massive, it was a huge, it was the known world, wasn't it? It reached as far as, as Asia there. They just took over all of these countries and dominated them. They needed everything from these countries and they knew how to get it. They were so systematic, they had a template mould for everything. So they knew. Britannia was the furthest output, it was the last territory to be conquered. Moreland Buxton wasn't on any Roman map. It had no importance, as you'll see shortly, you'll hear shortly. And it's because of the main routes. There were no main routes in this area. The main routes were from Londinium. What's Londinium? Londinium. Exactly, which was the first city, it was known as the first city, to Diva, which was the second city. What's Diva, anybody? Chester. Chester. Chester, of course, the River Dee, Diva Victrix. There were two main ports, the inland port at London and the outland port at Chester and in the, in the coast there. So that's how Romans planned it. They, they could come in here, they could come in there. 
but it was what they were taking to the poors that was uh, why they chose Chester as the, as the perfect place. That main route was along Watling Street. And the other one was uh, Londinium to Abaricum. Abaricum is York. York, along Ermine Street. York was a strategic place because it was already uh, a, a, a known place, but it was like the stepping stone to, to the north, to Hadrian's Wall. That was the route up to the north there. Everything was built on a system of forts, towns and fortlets. And the road network was laid out to maximise a monopoly on the island. <coughs> the, um, sorry, I'm going to look at my notes as well. The forts that we know of round here are uh, Glossop, which is Melandra Castle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that was the known fort. And Navio in Bruff in the Hope Valley. That was a fort as well. There was nothing in Buxton. Nothing that we know of. Because there was no structure there left. <coughs> and uh, in, the, in the Hope Valley. And the, another town in the southwest was Roxeter. Shrewsbury and Deventio, which was, of course, Derby. These were all important for, forts. Um... By force or coercion, the tribes were absorbed into Roman rule. Basically, the tribes were just turned into slaves. They were the Roman slaves. They had no choice. The Celts fought against the Romans countless times. They were always standing up to them. Well, of course you would. You know, if suddenly we nowadays were invented, invent, invaded by, I don't know, you know, tribes of people from the outer Russian reaches there, trying to take over everything. We'd be upset as well. We'd say, well, hang on a minute. No, not a chance, not a chance. So those were the administrative towns. The local forts um, were Lutadarum, which nobody really knows for sure. Uh, they found pigs of lead um, uh, in Worksworth. Uh, so they're assuming that Lutadarum was there. And Navio in Bruff was the Hope Valley. And, of course, Arditalia which is the, um, the fortress at um, uh, Glossop there. Buxton was an auxiliary fort. An auxiliary of this period would have housed a large detachment of Roman legions, for example, a cohort or an auxiliary wing, which means a small settlement. Finds on Buxton Marketplace, uh, on Silverlands, where they found... At the beginning of the last century, when they were doing building the houses there on Holker Road, they found several hearths, Roman hearths, and other bits of pottery. So they know that the Romans had some kind of little settlement there. But what was it? What was the whole point of, of that area? But it wasn't a fortlet, or a, it was not a fortlet, or a small marching camp. So the, the, the soldiers weren't really stationed there. They didn't really have that much presence, and therefore. They went under the radar as far as the writers were concerned. Because there weren't any battles happening in Buxton. So how did the Romans get about? Well, they followed um, river systems. Of course, the River Humber um, goes all the way. The source of the River Humber is the River Wye in Buxton. From where it leaves the River Wye... It flows down through Buxton, down to Bakewell, um, Matlock, Derby, where it becomes the River Trent, uh, and, sorry, the River Derwent, which is where the Dar uh, Derventio comes from, Derwent, or the Derwent comes from uh, Derventio. Then it becomes the River Trent in the Nottingham area, and then it goes out to the River Humber. On another hill in Buxton, up on Axe Edge, that river starts there and becomes the River Dove. Is it called the River Dove? And that goes all the way uh, out to um, the, uh, what's it called, up, 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 Wallace, up onto the Mersey. Up onto the Mersey. That becomes the River Mersey. Mm. So both of those. So it was easy for the Romans to f go upstream and follow uh, the rivers and transporting things along the river systems. The Roman Empire was already hundreds of years old by the time the Romans got here. They knew exactly what to do. These weren't, these weren't experimental 
people. They, they, they were expert in their, in their trade. They knew what they were coming for, and they weren't going anywhere until they got it, because Rome needed it all. Here you see, I don't know how much this is going to work. A little bit. I don't know many of some can see. Can you all see my little, my little yeah. weapon? Yeah. So you see the size of the Brigantes' uh, kingdom here. Here's uh, up at Corbridge there. You'll see this is the area of uh, Hadrian's Wall. There's a, bar a Barricum, which is York. And there you'll see the Corritani there at Lincoln. And there, look, see, we're there, where the point is. That, level with uh, Chester, that's where Buxton is. Yeah. So you can see that the three areas were kind of pretty much merged and nobody makes the same map about these territories. Everyone's got a different opinion. But I think for a certain one reason that they met in our area. And I'll go further with that. <coughs> Closer to home there in Buxton, that's narrowed down a wee bit there. Um, there you see, uh, right in the middle, there's Buxton. There's Auditalia in Glossop. Bruff in uh, Hope Valley, Templeborough, what's that? Sheffield, it's like the Sheffield area. Mamukium, which is Manchester, which the uh, Rome, the road from Manchester comes along Hazel Grove, up over Disley Tops, down through Whaley Bridge, up over Old Road, up Elna Lane, over by Whitehall, out over Seuss and down into Buxton. That is the Roman road from Manchester to... But you see, it's just a dotted line. It wasn't anything specific. It wasn't a real road. They just followed the routes that the Celts had already established as their trade routes and as their animal movement routes. In the Witches there, Middle Witch, North Witch, Salt area, that goes off the way to Chester, off the way to uh, Chester. Uh, and here you see the, the signs here, uh, the, the round circles indicates it's a settlement and the square that it was a fort. Well, Buxton was neither. It was neither, it was neither, it was half of a settlement, but it had something special about it as well. <coughs> And here, down here, Deventio, still called Little Chester to this day, but it's Derby. We call it Derby now, and Roster. So, so what was it that kept the Romans here once they arrived after AD 79? Well, there was various things. It wasn't just the waters. We know about the waters. The rivers, they enabled minerals to be moved easily, transported along barges, along the river systems, what we think is a little river down the river going. No, some of these rivers by the Trent, they're really, really wide. Um, the workforce, the Briganti tribe, and their queen, Carti Mandua. Quite a few things written about Carti Mandua, some books, and there's a bit of a film as well. So if you're interested, have a, have a little look up, up, up at her. She's quite an interesting character. She needs... She's comparing to uh, um, uh, Boudicca because she was just as important in, in my opinion. The food source. Tons and tons of food around here. Crops on the lowlands, easy to raise crops. Meat aplenty, all kind of meat. Um, mostly sheep. Uh, but fish. The rivers had fish, of course they did. The geology. The geology was really important and that's really what the Romans <coughs> came here for. The limestone. The limestone and its many byproducts. Limestone can be converted into literally dozens of, of products. It's baked in kilns, and some people here will be working in the in the quarrying industry, maybe in the in the kiln industry. When you bake limestone and render it down, it has a myriad of uses. It becomes a powder compound, quicklime amongst one of them. Call it slate lime. Quick, um, cut like baked limestone is used for mortar. It sticks bricks and stone together. It's used in the construction industry. It's a building material in its own right, the stone. Uh, but the reduced product um, is used for, like I say, for, for mortar. So it's, it, uh, limestone builds walls, used for houses, bridges, public buildings, and roads, of course. We underpin our roads, don't we? Still with a limestone um, <coughs> chatter. I call it chatter, that's what my dad used to call it. I know it's break down, broken down limestone. Sorry about that. Uh, and paint. Did you know we still use lime, quick lime in paint in our paint products? Lime white washing the walls. 
It's a natural product, so it doesn't have the problems of breathing, but you do need to continue keep coating your walls in it. Antiseptic. Do you know we use limestone in the medicinal uses to this very day? It's even now used in your toothpaste. Yeah, you know, when you brush your teeth, it's lime, quick limestone. It's, it's, it's got dozens and dozens of uses. In agriculture, I don't know if many of you remember, my dad used to drive one of these, um, used to drive a tanker with quick lime in it, spread it all over the land in the uh, in certain time of the year. It sweetens the soil or the grass. It neutralises the acids in the, in the soil. <coughs> so it's a really important product for that. Ammunition. What did uh, people used to do with quick lime in those uh, <coughs> olden days? Well, they would throw it in the faces of enemies. If you get a bag of cement and you start, you don't wear your gloves and your goggles, and the cement powder starts blowing around, it can really damage your eyes. You know, it, it burns. It's really uh, physical. If anybody's seen the black, what's it called, the um, Blue Lagoon in Buxton at the top of Harper Hill, there, which is all the slag heaps from the lime industries there, those pools, all the lime is so seeping out of the out of the lime slag, and uh, it's got a toxicity. It's got is equal to um, bleach. So when people bathe in that water, they're almost bleaching the skin. So again, it's the lime, it's the lime. And the disposal of dead. Many people, you know, uh, will be aware that um, uh, to dispose of a dead body in graves, they would coat it all in quick lime. So yeah, it's had a <coughs> lot of uses. So the lead ore, lead. Lead is found in limestone. It's one of the biggest products that comes out of it. Around Derbyshire in the White Peak in the limestone area, there are thousands of um, uh, lead kilns. As far to the deepest parts of Derbyshire that you've probably never even heard of. Um, and it's no surprise to know that the first uh, lead mines here were... It's, yeah. it's uh, cheap, easy to come by, very dangerous product. Uh, about as dangerous as your quick lime, but very, very useful. Um, dozens of uses it has. Anybody want to know? A few? Can anybody say a few um, lime uses of lead? Pipes, plumbing. Pipes and plumbing. Yeah. yeah <coughs> Roofs. Yeah. Yes, in your roof, it's sealing your roof. It's a pliable metal, soft metal. It's easily achieved, uh, and in my opinion, shot. yeah, lead shot. Exactly, weapon. Yeah. In my opinion, lead was more valuable than gold. You couldn't do anything with gold except make jewellery out of it. However, with lead, it's, it's got dozens of uses. Um, I'll come to those in a moment. Yep. Uh, well, we'll just give you a few. Plumbing pipes, we say, wine sweetener. One study found out that um, the end of the Roman Empire, where people were dying, you know, where all the, all the rich upper crust were dying, they were quaffing loads of red wine. Well, they put lead in wine to sweeten it. They probably all died of lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> that's what happened, doesn't it? They all went insane, and now we know about this. If we can work out that that's what killed them. You know, not, not the ravages of, of battle. It was, the, it was the wine that did it for them. <laughs> um, it lined copper pans. It's used in, in kilns, used in kilns. Plumbing, pipes, uh, statues and ornaments. All your lead ornaments. Roofs and gutters, lead coins, standard weights. In, the, in one of the villages in the hinterlands of books in Elton, they have um, one of the pubs there is called the, lead, the Miner's Standard, and that's where they take the lead to be weighed, and then they get paid per, per amount of lead. So, yeah, it was um, important for that as well. Coffins, lead coffins. Yeah, lead yeah. Cisterns, water cisterns, it held the water. Poisoning people, of course. Um, tanks, projectiles, as you said, um, bullets, missiles, and other implements of war, as well as in the shipbuilding industry and the building industry in general. So you can see why, for the Romans, lead was massively important, and they just made sure they got as much of it as possible, which is what the forts were for. When they tasked the, the, the tribes to, to get the lead, the lead would be then taken to the forts and, and fashioned and shaped, and, and then it would go on to then go off to the big ports and taken off back to, back to Rome. 
Lead can also contain silver ore. Not very much around here. Um, I'm not very too much sure of how much um, uh, silver ore there is, but that's where silver comes from too within the, silver, uh, within the lead ore. Um, where else can the Romans hear? Establish tribal roots in the moorlands. And of course, Mrs. Harding, who's fallen asleep over there because it's so nice and warm in here. She's been waiting for this for over a month <laughs> and she's dropped off to sleep. <laughs> and of course, the thing that kept Romans here in Buxton were the warm springs. They resembled religion and health in what was called the sacred grove. And there you'll see in that picture there uh, a, a today's um, thermal spring in a grove. The waters where Buxton comes up from the centre of town is where the limestone meets the gritstone and through cracks and fissures between those rocks is where these ancient waters come to the bubble to the surface of the land. There, right through the middle of Buxton. Coming down from like uh, what's uh, Burbage area um, it was known as a sterile swamp so you can see there that's how the the Celts would have used it and we'll explain why the Celts used it as well very shortly the mineral wealth Roman the Romans were very needy and very greedy by the time they completed the Roman Empire they needed to maintain that power and everything that enabled them in building, in <coughs> manufacture, in jewellery, in wealth. They couldn't get enough of it, which is why all the countries in the Roman Empire were conquered. And why Britain, when, they, when it was discovered, they knew what to, to do here. They'd already done it for hundreds of years on the Roman Empire before they got to Pax Britannia. It needed ever more resources to supply Rome. There you see a picture there of... of a, the cruel treatment that the Romans put the... Uh, no wonder they downed tools and rebelled against them, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I would, in any case. They weren't having anything. The Brigantes were a fierce tribe. They had a queen, you know. They, they weren't going to let these invaders tell them what to do. Why not? And here you see some more products that are made out of limestone and lead. And you'll see that, that's just a depiction of some of the cooking vessels that they've discovered in, in archaeological digs. Um... Some of them can hardly work out what they are, but a lot of them are very familiar today. Vessels and... Is that a... Um, see this here? That's a, like a, a vessel there with a point on the bottom. And the, what's it called? That? A trench? Trench? A trench or something there? Um, yeah, but they need to hook that over the fire and they'd make biscuits out of that, you know, press it into the mould and everything. Ladles... No wonder, they, no wonder they were poisoned. I mean, really, no wonder. They weren't defeated, but they poisoned themselves with all these riches. They had no idea, did they? When Dr. Um, Robertson, um, in the 19th century, uh, was part of the doctors in, in Buxton's hospital system during the, uh, when, when, the, when the Devonshire Dome was a hospital, the water was pumped up to the Devonshire Dome in lead pipes Dr. Robinson knew about the properties of lead and he said, well, nobody's going to get well from drinking lead-contaminated water. And he stopped the, he stopped the use of uh, the water going up to the hospital. From then on, the sick, poor people went from the hospital down to the pump room, to the baths, at the back of the Crescent, I have to tell you. They weren't mixing with the rich people. Only the rich people could go and take the waters in books and baths. The poor people in the hospital behind... Uh, they just had to um, go through the back door, as Lois and I found out one day when we went sneaking around at the back when they were refurbishing the um, when we were refurbishing the the crescent. Lois and I sneaked under the in a door under the old hall hotel. We did. Lois was scared. I wasn't. I thought, well, what can they say? <laughs> just investigating some Roman stuff. It's fascinating down there. The fourth thing that kept the Romans here was a cave. Many of you know the cave, it's called Pool's Cavern, or Pool's Hole, as it was known. Pool was a what, 14th century vagabond, he was a naughty guy. Doesn't, a lot of people don't know too much about him, but the Pole family were very well to do in a certain part of South Derbyshire. 
he was just a highwayman, a robber, a murderer and a thief. And he used to lure travellers into the cave and kill them, basically, and rob them and, uh, and do away with them. But way before him, the Romans were using the cave. And way before the Romans, the Celts were using the cave as well. Of course, of course what it offered. It had been used by people, humans, since the end of the last ice age. And we know that because of things that have been found in the cave. It's over three million years old, formed by water dissolving the limestone rock on a downhill trajectory. And it's, has anybody been, has everybody been to Poole's yeah. Cavern? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah? It's amazing. I used to be a tour guide there, and uh, that's what really sparked a lot of my interest in the Romans in Buxton. When I used to realise that, my goodness me, this cave, there's no way it wasn't used by the Romans. Because at, at all times of the year, regardless of what's outside, it's 11 degrees centigrade in there year round. So in the middle of winter, it's baking hot. In the middle of summer, it's freezing cold. It's like a, it's all relative, isn't it? But it, when it's minus centigrade, what, five, 10 degrees, minus five, survival matters. So of course they would have used the cave uh, to survive the, the, those winter months, the Romans. I have no doubt about it. Um, Lismore Road, down below the cave, which is at the back of there on the way towards um, uh, Burbage there. So all those, all those fields down there, which now are all houses. Lismore Field, um, which is undergoing another archaeological survey and, and protection, they did a survey there, and they found a, a bronze cooking bowl there. And then they did a survey, uh, they did a study on the um, foliage that was there, and they found seeds and grains that were from that period. So we know that the Bronze Age people were using the cave and, uh, and then having that Lismore Road area as a settlement. It offered safety, it offered warmth, and it offered materials in the Victorian period, when Buxton was at its heyday of uh, tourism and, and spa health and medical treatment, it was the, one of the centres of excellence for rheumatism and arthritis trouble, people coming to take the waters. But it was only the rich people. And Buxton was a, an amazing place, which is why it's full of hotels and guest houses and very ornate buildings. It was the, the top place to come to. And the cave, um, they did an, an initial dig out of the cave. And that's where they started finding some of these, some of these things was turning up in the soil. Many things, thousands of things, must have been stuck in the hole behind and bricked up. We're never going to know. But in about 1989, 18, 1982, it says there, isn't it? They did a proper archaeological dig. You know the path that you go through when you go through the tunnel, and then you go, and there's all the soil up there, and there's the soil up there. They did a proper, and they found over 4,000 items there including skeletal remains, as you can see there. The water, the acidic, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the water dripping through the limestone, the rain, carrying that, that quick lime stuff with it, landing on the bones, they dissolved and they become part of the, of the, of the rock. So there you'll see human bones there. But these are just a fraction of the finds that they found in there. It was a Roman jewellery workshop. The thick clay soil in there was perfect for making moulds in which they cast all manner of, of things to sell as, as trinkets, as clothes fastenings, as chatelaines, as um, brooches, earrings. Those studs there, they've got faces on them. That's a chatelaine. So... The chatelaine was, uh, they hang it on the belt and it's for you, it's got earwax scoop and a spot squeezer and, uh, and tweezers. <laughs> well, we're just humans, aren't we? we have, they, they had all of those things in those times as well. Buckles and belts and annulars, things to fasten your clothes together with. They found all of these in there and they're still finding them. They are still finding. When people walk on the, all the mud and everything, not tourists, the cave, people who work at the cave, when they go and walk in all of that, Still places turned up there. It was used as a temple as well. There's a shrine in there at the back of the Roman chamber. There's a shrine there where they found lots of offerings given to the goddess of the cave. 
because the goddess of the cave protected them. She gave them security, safety. She gave them protection from the cold weather. And she gave them all these riches in the cave. And burials. There are several burials in there. So people, it was so venerated that they buried their dead in there. Above Pool's Cavern is Grinlow, is Grinlow Hill, where Solomon's Temple is. That was built in about 1892, some kind of that kind of time, was it, Lois? But it was on top of an ancient burial mound. In the exhibition area, in Pool's Cavern, there's a huge amount more of the finds that they found in there, stalactites and stalagmites and a skull. The skull was found in the burial mound, which is atop Grinlow. When the Romans came here, they carried on the tradition of how the Celts were burying their people because it was, it was all over the place where people were burying their people the same way. They were building mounds, they were placing their revered dead in them uh, either in skeletal form or they were burning them to ashes and they had them incinerary urns. The Romans did all of that. They just stuck their, stuck their people in there. Why not? It was available there. So it was a very important feature. Finally, the element that people know Buxton for, the water, the thermal springs. Thermal springs is warm, it's warm water. Right where the warm waters come out of the ground in Buxton, 3,000 year old water, it runs along the side of where the springs come up. The river Y, the infant river Y, runs alongside it. For the Romans, it was a perfect place to have a Roman a Roman bath area. Thousands of years before Christianity, which is relatively a new religion, all humans were pagans. They had gods and goddesses for everything. Goddesses of the, the moon, the sun, the planets, plants, trees, seasons, day and night, everything that enabled a human being to thrive or survive or live or be cured had a god or goddesses attributed to it. When Christianity came along, it did away with all of those, wiped them all out and said, no, 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 there's one God for everything. So you can see why there was a conflict of, uh, uh, of interest, really, between the, the pagans. And in this area, even this area, in the, in the very, um, un very low inhabited places around here, Christianity took a long time to assimilate in small communities, even in this area. The pagan ways were traditional, and we still, we don't realise it, but we still have a lot of our pagan traditions. It's all been merged with Christianity now, so it's, the lines are a bit blurred. The Romans had more gods and goddesses than you could think <coughs> about. Every, all of their lives revolved around gods and goddesses. They have little temples and the goddess of this and goddess uh, of love, Venus. You know, they had, they had everything. And, and in Rome itself... Everywhere you went, there were temples and uh, little shrines to the gods and the goddesses, whichever one they favoured. Water is literally life. There's only one other element that we can't do without, and that's oxygen. Don't know what the god of oxygen was or the goddess of oxygen was, but the water goddess was the most revered because without water, we have no life. It is fundamental to life. So the god water goddesses were the most revered. Let me just go to my notes now. The Celts, from the Nemetis region of the, of the Rhine in, Germ in, in Germany, not Germany then, Germany now, they, their water goddess of the grove was called Nemetis, Nematona. When you think about it in Latin terms, Nematona, Nematoids, it's living waters, it's little thing creatures in living waters, isn't it? Nem nem it's called nematoids. Nematodes. Nematodes. <laughs> so, the goddess of uh, the water, Nematona, um, when they came across the water goddess, uh, that was the goddess of the grove as well, Nematona. The Romans Latinized um, waters of and called it water uh, aquia. That means waters of. And gro grove goddess, they called it Nematona, and put R, and nobody's really too sure what the R is, and they called it R Nemetia. So the waters of the goddess 
Nematoda of the Grove. That's what they called it. Christianity came along then, when the Romans were just coming to the end of their empire there. It took a long time for Christianity to assimilate in Rome, but it did eventually. And so Christianity took over Arnometia and uh, named it Anne, Arn, St. Anne. There you go, that's how it comes. A lady has written a little booklet about this, available in the uh, visitor centre in the pub room in Buxton, as Megan will know about that. It's a little booklet that explains about this goddess who comes from basically the goddess, uh, one of the Greek goddesses and all, all the ancient goddesses. It's the goddess of water. <clears throat> the native Celts' um, religion, their hierarchy, their priests, were the Druids. The Romans didn't get the Druids. They, they kind of retreated to um, Anglesey, didn't they? The, but the Romans couldn't get, get them. Well, the, the, the native Celts' priest's hood was the Druids. This was their ritual space. It's just like a church. It was a place of, of, of worship. Um, and, of course, when you've got a, a, a place of worship and you know the benefits of those water, it was a place of healing as well. So people went on uh, for healing, which is right up until nowadays when you go to a spa retreat. That water has got healing properties in it. So it's not just now, or the Victorians that went to Buxton Waters for the healing. They've been doing it for thousands of years. That uh, photo there is uh, at the back of, this, um, back of the pump in the, in the well, in the bottom there. There's a beautiful array of stained glass windows. And there you see the goddess uh, Nematona, the waters there, the goddess of plenty, the goddess of life. see what's coming next. So, warm springs are plenty. There are lots and lots of thermal springs in England. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are. Some of them, anybody know which some of them are? Bath. Bath. Uh, apart from Bath. Wellington. <laughs> 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 Uh, Harrogate's, Harrogate's yeah. warm, yeah. Spa. Matlock has got its warm springs. Yeah. Royal Tunbridge Wells. The Romans would have known about those as well. However, um, they only gave two places in the entirety of the British Isles where there's warm waters coming out the ground. Only two places did they give that special title, Spa Resort, to. In the whole of the Roman Empire, right as far as Asia Minor, they only gave seven places where there's warm springs, that title, Aquia. And two of those were on this tiny little island. So that's how important Aquia Arnometeo was to the Romans. Yet it's got no, it's got no, because the period's gone. The Romans have gone. It's all been replaced now. It's, now their time's been and gone. So the first thermal spa resort, Aquia Sulis, named after the goddess Sulis Minerva. Um, and today, very unimaginatively, we Bath. call that city Bath. Bath. Bath, or however you want to. But of course, when they invaded on the south coast in AD 43, they would have found, you know, they would have found Bath pretty early. It's the same kind of situation of Buxton as Buxton. Warm springs coming up from the ground, surrounded by hills all around it. And as we know, the city of Bath was developed into one of the biggest Roman cities in the whole of the country. And more and more is being discovered as we go along. Yet in Buxton... Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Because in the 1700s, when the fifth Duke of Devonshire from Chatsworth, who owned all of that estate, the Chatsworth estate, still does in parts of Buxton, he decided to develop uh, Buxton as a <coughs> hotel on top of the Thermal Springs. Reports and writings say that they found lead baths under there and Roman coins and trinkets and offerings to the gods and goddesses. Throw a coin in a fountain. We still do it, don't we? Here's a coin in the fountain. Offer the rope. We would just carry on doing it from there. What had happened in the 1500s, um, uh, after the Romans left, the waters were already famous, but spa therapy became a big thing as doctors were recommending people to go to these spa resorts. And the Old Hall Hotel was built on top of the biggest bath there. 
It was built for Mary, Queen of Scots. She was held captive by the uh, uh, Bess of Hardwick and her husband, um, one of her four husbands. George Talbot. George Talbot, yes. So they, they had, that was all chaps of the state. He built that hotel for, for Mary and eminent people to take the waters. The poor lady, as young as she was when she died, was riddled with arthritis and rheumatism. And she used to come to stay in Buxton, the new hall, as it was known then, under which there is still this, this big bath there. But then in the 1700s, the fifth Duke of Devonshire, who had a very beautiful socialite wife called Georgiana, she was off all over the country, down south, to Bath especially, um, socialite. She was up to no good. She was having children with eminent people, and uh, it all went very wrong. You can watch the film, Georgiana. I think so, yeah, Georgiana. She was called Georgiana, apparently, so that was true. Uh, and if you wonder why... In the middle of woolly sheep area Buxton, this beautiful semicircular building was constructed in the 1700s. It's because the Duke of Demich had built a mini bath of the north. It was to keep his wayward wife up here where he could, she could entertain <laughs> her own people. You know. So they, they eradicated all of the Roman stuff. That, that's it. That's all Roman trace was, was gone by them. So, let's have a look at uh, uh, Sulis, Aquia Sulis um, Bath and Aquia Arnimetia. Anybody know when Buxton became called Buxton? I'll tell you. In about the 12th century. It comes from the Buck Stones. The Buck being, this was all the, the king's deer hunting lands in the forest of the peak. And the stones, there's plenty of uh, hilltop stones there. So it was called the Book Stones, and that's how it came Buxton in the, in the 12th century. So it's very unromantic, but that's how it is. So let's compare now Buxton and Bath. Well, obviously, we can see some of the obvious differences between Buxton and Bath. Um, so, but why wasn't Bath a, sophistic a sophisticated spa city like Aquiasulis? It had all the same things. Bath's water is even warmer. However, it tastes horrible. If anybody's been to Bath and tasted the water, it's like the dishwashing water. Oh, it's just nasty. It's sulfurous. It's, you want to spit it out straight away. Well, the water temperature. Bath's average winter lowest temperature, uh, the climate there, is uh, 44 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 7.2 degrees centigrade. Buxton's average winter lowest is 0.8 degrees centigrade. There's a big difference in altitude, a big difference in altitude. The water temperature, uh, bath water for bathing in, uh, uh, between 34 and 45 degrees centigrade. In old money, that's uh, 93 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Comparing it to Buxton's water, which is a constant 27 degrees centigrade, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, Buxton's is uh, cooler, is it? It's blood temperature, basically, which is why it's nice for swimming in, because it's almost blood temperature. Uh, I've done it in the wrong order, this now. Altitude. Bath is 82 metres above sea level, 269 feet. That's not very high, is it? Not for us, around here. Buxton's temp altitude is 305 metres, 1,000 feet above um, sea level. It's cold and it's, it's cold and chilly in moorlands area. It just happens to be in a valley, in a valley in the middle of the moorlands. So you can see why Bath Buxton didn't become as developed for the Romans as, as, as Bath did. And the age of the water. Bath's water comes from the ground but it fell as rainwater 10,000 years before it came back to the surface of the water again. By comparison, Buxton's water, which fell on Goit Moor, all that area up near the Captain Fiddle, filters down through the ground, and uh, 5,000 years later, it comes up in the middle of Buxton through the thermal spring. It's gone right down to the, through the rocks and through the all the different kinds of rocks, and then it starts coming back up again, picking up different kinds of rocks and the mineral content that's in it, 
And by the time it comes to the surface, it's sweet and warm and the best tasting mineral water, in my opinion, bar none. If you've drunk bath water, you'll know there's no comparison whatsoever. <laughs> All right. the, uh, the, the image of Minerva there, the goddess Minerva, um, that was what was found when they were excavating in Bath. It stands very proudly in one of their exhibition areas. It just shows you the level of technology and sophistication that the Romans were at. We kind of think of them as just as Roman soldiers, don't we? But really, no, they were so sophisticated. We really underestimate them sometimes. So, us and them. Now and then. But there's something that links us intrinsically. <coughs> And it's what we need to survive, apart from water. We all share the same water, don't we? But it's, it's food and drink. In Italy, do you think the recipes have changed since the Roman times? No. In Italy, those, those recipes are still the same. They're still eating the same food. It's the same. They're, they're still made there. They still grow there. It's the same produce. And drink, well, as I said before, the wine was sweetened to make it palatable, to make it sweet with the lead, with the, uh, sorry, the, the, the lime, lead, sorry. So yeah, but, uh, and then you see the, a, an image of some dishes, some food. It could be today's dinner, couldn't it? It could be today's. Pulses, honey, meat, grains, fish, that's scallops there, cheeses, eggs, fruit. And down here in the bottom, <coughs> you see that little thing there? That's chickpea. Chickpea pancakes, it's called, in the city of Chechina, it's called, uh, they're called uh, Chechen. And today, that's still eaten in certain parts as, as a normal snack, everyday snack. Like we go to the chippy, they go for a Chechen, a, a, a Chechen slice. And in the baths, when the Roman emperors used to uh, lounge in the baths and wallow and chat and what the men always did there, they would be served with these slices of chichin warm straight out the pan, spiced and salt and pepper and in between a slab of bread usually. So yeah, there's nothing that reaches across the generations such as food and wine. But also there's something else, isn't there? It's that verbal history. It's a good story. We just love telling a good story, don't we? Before I move on to that, talking about the food, I've prepared a couple of um, Roman treats over here for you. And I've also prepared a, a recipe sheet with six authentic Roman recipes on about all of which I have made, I have to tell you, and some a couple of times. And these are um, sesamides, which are like little sesame seed biscuits. And the other ones are uh, uh, cinnamon, um, cinnamon, what are they called? Anyway, cinnamon biscuits. They're like ginger biscuits, but they're cinnamon. It's made with spelt, which is the ancient Roman grain. Honey and uh, cinnamon, and it's they're very they're a bit brittle, so be careful. Dip it in your tea. Um, they're not very sweet because it's our sweet present time where we're so used to sugar. But uh, I think James, you've tried one, haven't you? And he loved it. I, I, I might have overbaked them, so don't worry about. Them. Pretend they've been done in a Roman oven. <laughs> it's just overbaked a little bit. But anyway, help yourself to to one of, a sample of each, and if anybody's interested. Uh, take a sheet of recipes and have a go at making them yourself. Uh, and, uh, yes, yeah, so let's, let's go to the... And a good yarn. We like telling stories, don't we? I'm doing it to you now. I'm telling you a story. I'm explaining. I'm going back in time and piecing to... And don't we all love a good gossip? And don't we like Coronation Street and all that? We're no different. We're absolutely no different to people those, to back, back then. And up until people could write and read, verbal history was the way that information was passed along, whether that was in song format or, or whatever format, or poetry or rhyming or just verbally passing on the, the information. You know when your, your family member passes down what happened three generations ago, it's that continuation of, 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 of stories that has happened in the past. Um, in song and poetry and prose. And it was just a way as a, as a way to commemorate and explain and remember things. Before literacy, those were the only way of recording of the Christie because people just couldn't read or write. Those stories, though, 
if, if somebody forgets the story or it just isn't passed on, it's all disappeared. We've lost more than what we've, we've retained. However, in our miraculous modern times, it is now possible to piece together the known facts, <coughs> details, finds and discoveries and then weave a narrative around them and create a novel. That's what I've done. I've, I've, I've created a narrative around the Romans and their, what they were doing here, what they were eating, what they were doing with people, where, why they were here. So I've created a narrative. And because of the internet and, and more books, we can, we can piece together stuff about the Romans. There's only one or two pieces of academic writing about the Romans. Not enough for anybody to be uh, interested in, as we found out in the Buxton Roman Society. Nobody wants to know about it because there's no money in it. So if there's no investment and there's nothing to, no fortress to go and see like you can at Roxeter down there in Lichfield. You can go see the Roman fort there. You can go to Derby, you can go and see the Romans in there. And Chester, we went to Chester, the Roman walls there. It's all visible, but in Buxton there's nothing, so it's just all disappeared. Yet they were there till the very end. So, what were the locals doing uh, 350 years ago? Well, they were exchanging their stories, they were living their life, and I'm sure they must have had their historians. But by the time the Romans left, the Celts were all assimilated into the Roman way of life. When the Romans left, they just went like that. The people left behind, who were now Celtic Roman Celts, they didn't have any identity anymore because they were servants of the Romans. So what became of those? We're never going to know. We're never going to know. There you see the Roman writer Tacitus. He wrote annals um, and from which we can gather a lot of the behaviour of, of life. And he wrote the saga of Queen Cartimandua. So here we go, the good yarn. He wrote about the... Although we wouldn't have known about if it weren't for Tacitus and her consort, Venutius. Venutius sounds a bit Roman, doesn't it? It made me confused, but, you know, that's what it was. I don't know what his, his Celtic name was, but he was called Venutius. Um, <coughs> and at the time... King Caracatus, you remember the court of King Caracatus? Mm -hmm. It's not just a poem, it's a true story. It's, if you know the story, I only know blah, 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 the court of King Caracatus. But it's one of those stories that's been passed down the line and it is a true story. Caracatus was one of the kings of the, one of the, Roman, of the tribes, the British tribes at the time. And um, he tried to stand up to the Romans and he uh, was defeated. And he came running to Cartimandua for, um, for comfort and, and protection. Yeah. He led that rebellion, the court of King Caracatus, but he was defeated. However, it did not end very well for uh, Cartimandua. Give me a second now. Let me just uh, pull my notes together and make them... So, when he led the defeat against the, the rebellion against the Romans, it was sanctuary that he sought amongst the brigands. Imagine it all happened in Buxton. You know, you know, we don't know. It could have very well because, you know, he was from one of the south southern tribes, and uh, Cartimandua had all of the north of England right down to Derby or Buxton. Buxton, we'll, we'll go with Buxton, shall we? And uh, so. Um, he, he saw the sanctuary. No, However, um, Cartiman Dua handed him over to the Romans, not a traitor, and they rewarded her with wealth and jewels. In order to keep the Romans on her side, um, Cartiman Dua um, kind of sidled with them, and uh, unfortunately, her people rejected her because they just saw she she traded them out. She defeat she she just. Treacherous. She just went and sided with the enemy, basically. She divorced her husband, Venutius, on a whim and married his armour bearer. What a traitor. What a traitor. 
Of course, her husband was. Doesn't it sound like Coronation Street? <laughs> it, it's, I tell you, what, the, the one Roman writer said, "There's nothing new under the sun," and there really, really isn't. Scorn, Venutius set about leading the tribe in battle against his ex-wife. Well, he wanted revenge, didn't he? So, um, Cartimandua, realizing this, thought she was in with the Romans. She went off to them and said, "Oh, help me! My tribe's turning against me." Can you send me some support? Can you send me some soldiers? No. All they sent was an auxiliary troop. A few little ragtaggled small troop. They didn't realise it was such a big thing. I oh, know. And that was it. Of course she was defeated. And she fled to the new city, city number two, Diva Victrix. And never heard from ever, ever again. Never written about. She just disappeared into obscurity. Caraticus, though, uh -huh, he was rewarded. He was taken to Rome and lived out his days very, very well, treated very well, and lived there till he died. So that's that's um, that's all real story, isn't it? So summing things up, part of the inspiration for creating this talk was this book called *The Constant Spring* by David Wilkinson. Um, it's available in all your local libraries. It's a very interesting little story where the writer has taken all of those known elements about Buxton and the Romans, the cave, the tribe, people, and he's woven a narrative through it, starting off with a Roman soldier who's sent to Buxton as a young man, uh, doing his training, he, and he meets up, he goes to the, the mystery woman, the, um, the witch who lives in a, a hovel on the outskirts of Buxton, somewhere up, but not Burbage, up on... <laughs> some, I imagine it's somewhere up um, Heathgrove area, there. It's somewhere up Heathgrove. And she has this daughter who works for the Romans. And this Roman soldier, he, of course, breathes with her. Well, not breathes, he marries her. But it's the conflict between the tribal people and the Roman soldier. But it takes their family through the whole period... And then, of course, when the Roman Empire falls, what happens to those people? What did happen to us when the Romans, when our invaders left? Well, we'll see. Um, so that's, that's what the story kind of creates. And who's to say he's just made it all? He might have been bang on the nail with his information. Because they fled, they would have gone to the nearest... If, the Rome, if there was no need for the Romans in Buxton, they would have just gone... Who was there to look after the baths? You know, there was no Romans coming anymore to the settlement there on the marketplace or going in the baths. They had no masters, so they were jobless, unemployed and homeless. <coughs> so they just went to the nearest congregation point that they knew of, which was like Roxeter or maybe Bruff. No, oh, that was just a fort. That was a fort where the minerals were taken to and then it was shipped off to the bigger, to the bigger ports. So the Romans just went. The Roman influence in England began with Julius Caesar's first landing on the shoreline of England in 55 BC. He was coming doing a recce, basically. And it ended with the famous look to your own defences letter in AD 40, 410 when the Romans abandoned the country and left it to the, to the locals. Nothing of any worth happened in Buxton for about a thousand years. A thousand years after the Romans left. What became of Buxton up till now only really started in the 15th century with the Old Hall Hotel and Mary Queen of Scots and uh, 16th. Well, that's another story. That's another story about Buxton. And, and that's it, really. What became of the Aquia? Nothing. It all fell apart. All of the valley, all the springs area, if the Romans were there, it just became wasteland. <coughs> Waste. Until uh, one of the, uh, till the um, Mary Queen of Scots Hotel was built there. And that's when it started becoming uh, anything of any worth. And that's the story of the Romans in Buxton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, if anybody 
getting, I'm not an expert, as I say. I only know what I'm talking about on here. So if anybody's got anything they'd like to add to that information, I'd be very welcome to hear it, as we all would as well. Or is it... Yes, yeah, so, but yes, yeah, so, um, so the, the, the constant spring is what the book's called. It's really, it's a nice little novel. It's a nice little novel, and it helps you to see a bigger picture of um, the Romans in Buxton. Very interesting. Have we any idea what the population was in the Celtic times? I don't think anybody would have. have no nobody, idea. nobody knows about the population because nothing was written down. It was prehistory, so no records were kept. And uh, as with all invaders, when you go and invade a territory, you just eradicate the history, and that's that's the, that's what they do, isn't it? You go and conquer somewhere, you eradicate all of their culture, all of their <coughs> writings, all of their jewelry. You take everything from them, and then you then you're control of them, and that's what the Romans did. So the biscuits here um, are.